I happen to be positive on China. Today's video, we're going to be listening to Howard Marks, where he got interviewed recently by William Green, who has just started his own new podcast, which is part of the We Study Billionaires podcast, which I highly recommend checking out. I'll leave a link in the description below to both the podcast and also William Green's most recent book that he put out last year, Richer, Wiser, Happier. Highly recommend both the podcast and his book. And also Howard Marks has his own podcast as well called The Memo all definitely worth listening to but in today's video we're just going to be listening to his most recent video where he sort of broke down his most recent thoughts on investing into china and just his general take on china at the moment anyway with that said let's jump on over and listen to howard marks one of my heroes was peter bernstein the the investment philosopher who died around 09 i believe and he wrote a memo which is one of the greatest things i ever read called can 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 we reduce risk? Can risk be reduced to a number? And one of the things in there is he said, there's a range. We don't know where the answer is going to fall within the range. Sometimes we don't know the extent of the range. China is, the range is enormous because we're dealing with cosmic questions. And, and by the way, not act, we think we can do economic analysis or financial analysis. These are not economic or financial questions. These are political, ideological, social questions. Uh, and um, so, but it's an important question because China is the second biggest economy in the world. And I have friends who can t tell me the date on which it will become the biggest economy in the world. Uh, and, uh, you know, I've always thought you should have money invested in China. And, you know, one of the things I've seen uh, over my years in this business is something comes up, whether it be index funds or emerging markets or something like that. And, and people say, oh, we got that covered. I got 2% in that. You know, if it's important, 2% is not enough. Uh, it won't move the needle. Now, people are happy with 2% because they, at least if, if it then goes on to quadruple, they can say, I participated. They don't have to kick themselves, uh, but it's not enough. And, and uh, so if China is going to become the world's biggest economy, and if things work out in a positive way in the long run, 2% in China is not enough, in my opinion. And as you say, we've had, uh, we've, we've had investments in Chinese equities, uh, we've been long-term investors in, in Chinese NPLs, uh, and, and we're investors in, chi in Chinese credits, debts. Um, how do you dope it out? Not easy. Uh, on the one hand, you do have the economic strength, size, and growth potential. Uh, on the other hand, you have the question of how will China behave towards its citizens, its businesses, and towards the rest of the world. And so in the last six months uh, or so, we've seen people say, uh, China is not investable. That's the word, uninvestable. Now, my ears perk up when I hear that because if, if nothing else, it introduces the possibility that China is cheap. By definition, nothing that people describe as uninvestable uh, can be uh, uh, born aloft on the winds of, of, uh, of uh, adoration. Uh, it, it, it's not overpriced. Maybe it's underpriced. Maybe it's something one should do. Uh, I'm not an expert in China. When I go to China and they always uh, say to me, well, what do you think about China? I said, why are you asking me? You live here. Uh, but um, it has been my view for the last half a dozen years. What I tell people is that uh, in this next little segment, I love how Howard Marks used the analogy that China is a young adolescent, um, whereas compared to other countries. So it's super interesting. Let's jump on over and listen to that. Uh, Europe and Japan are economic senior citizens, not much vitality. The US is a mature economic adult, uh, doing fine, but uh, I would argue that the best decades are behind us. China is an economic adolescent. Uh, and if you've ever had an adolescent in your house, as I have, then you know it can be tempestuous and there are ups and downs. But you also know that the adolescent's best decades lie ahead. And I describe China as an adolescent, economically speaking. This is 
an example of the ups and downs that I was talking about. Now, I didn't envision anything in particular, but you know, when they when they come down on for-profit education, uh, et cetera, and, and when the world worries about them geopolitically and militarily, that's what we're talking about here. Uh, when you get into the uh, into the, the uh, adolescence and the new, new things, uh, stuff can happen. I happen to be positive on China. You know, you, by the way, just like you couldn't prove the day after the Lehman bankruptcy that the financial system was not going to melt down, you can't prove what China's future holds. I happen to believe that China wants to be a member of the world community and that uh, Shanghai, for example, wants to be one of the world's centers of, of finance. And it would take a great leap of the imagination to think that those goals can be achieved if China does some of the geopolitical things people are afraid of them doing. That's it for today's video. We'll catch you in the next one. Cheers, guys.